Hello, and welcome to this meeting of the Planning and Development Council of the Town of Oakville. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, do we have any regrets for this meeting? We have no regrets. Thank you. Um, Council, are there any um, declarations of pecuniary interest? Madam Clerk, I see none. Uh, could we have a mover and seconder to resolve in the Committee of the Whole? Councillor Duddick and Councillor Lischina, thank you. Any objection? Madam Clerk, there's no objection, and we are resolved in the Committee of the Whole. Council, the first thing that occupies us tonight is the report, the project update on the 407 Transitway. And uh, uh, we have a presentation from Martin McGuire, the Manager of Transportation Strategy, if you require it. But uh, the report's very clear. Uh, the province is um, backing off of the transitway station for the uh, Neagawa and 407 area. This kind of vexes our official plan and, uh, and harms the economic development of the area, as um, Councillor Palmer and Councillor Sanju have noted in a resolution that they have brought to us tonight. And uh, before I turn to the councillors, I'll check and see if anybody wants the presentation, and otherwise, I'll just explain procedurally what we might do. We, we have a recommendation in the agenda, plus the uh, suggestion from the councillors, and I would suggest that we pass item number one and item number two as written, insert a new item three being the resolution material from Councillor Palmer and Councillor Sandhu, and then renumber <clears throat> excuse me, the existing item three as number four. Is everybody okay with that? I see no objection, uh, Madam uh, Clerk. Uh, so now, is there anyone who wants the presentation or are you happy with the report as read? All right, Madam Clerk, I will ask if there's any objection to the motion, uh, which I will suggest is moved by Councillor Palmer and seconded by Councillor Sandrew in recognition of their work on the matter. And they've, they've signified their assent. Is there any objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there is none and it is adopted. Thank you, everybody. Uh, the next uh, item or two is the, our public hearing items. And uh, the most important part about this is this is the information for the public session. It's not a recommendation or decision uh, item this, this night. It's an information collecting, an issue collecting uh, session tonight. And uh, if there's anyone watching the live stream of this meeting on oakville.ca and you wish to speak to this item, you can call 905-815-6095 and we will connect you to the meeting. You'll be called upon to speak following the registered delegations. Uh, we have a registered delegation from Carolyn McMinn, who's the president of the Trafalgar Chartwell Residence Association, and a Terence Glover, who's the agent for the applicant. Um, I, I do not uh, want to overlook that we also have a presentation ready by Trish Collingwood, our senior planner, and I think this is important for the benefit of the public so they'll know what we're talking about. Um, Mr. Uh, Simeone, uh, are you gonna introduce Trish or is, are we gonna go just cut cold to Trish? I think we'll just cut cold to her, uh, Your Worship. Well, I see her waiting. Trish, you have the Zoom. And that's what we say instead of the floor now. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Burton. Good evening, everyone. The purpose of this report is to present the zoning bylaw amendment application, as Mayor Burton mentioned, submitted by Randall Oakville Developments Limited and Church Oakville Developments Limited in conjunction with the required statutory public meeting. As noted by my report, there are no decisions to be made tonight um, at this time and the staff report is to be received by council. A virtual public information meeting was held by the applicant on September 17th and the meeting was attended by 12 residents and business owners and a summary of those comments received at the meeting is included in Appendix B of my staff report. Next slide. Oops. 
The development consists of three individual parcels, 150 Randall Street, 125 Navy Street, and 143 Church Street, which I'll show on my next slide. The subject properties have a combined lot uh, area of approximately 0 0.348 hectares and are located at the southeast corner of Randall and Navy Street. The properties have frontage on Randall, Navy, and Church Streets. The surrounding land uses um, to the site, to the properties include to the north is Randall Street and a 12-story residential building. To the east is the four-story residential building on Randall Street uh, that's under construction. And it includes the one, uh, sorry, um, the heritage, the heritage building along at the corner of Randall and um, Thomas Street. To the south is Church Street, uh, the community living building and uh, commercial uses on the south side of Church Street. And to the west is Navy Street and the Oakville Performing Arts Center, Centennial Pool, Oakville Galleries and the Oakville Central Library. Next slide, please. So this shows the three properties outlined. Um, property at 150 Randall currently is occupied by a vacant two-story mixed-use building. 125 Navy is occupied by a two-story office building. 143 Church Street is occupied by a two-story house that was converted into a restaurant. All existing structures are proposed to be demolished um, with vehicular access proposed from Randall Street. The existing shared access laneway from Church Street um, that I'll show in a little bit is intended to be retained as a secondary emergency access. Next slide, please. Through the approval of OPA 20, the Central Business District, which is shown in the upper corner, um, when uh, all of downtown was was considered central business di district um, and it was replaced by OPA 20 with mixed use designations, including the urban core, which is our upper um, upper land use designation for the mixed uses. The building height for the urban core land use designation is eight to 12 stories, thereby it increases the maximum height on this site from four stories to 12. Next slide, please. The subject lands are identified in Schedule A1, the urban structure, as forming part of the growth area for the downtown Oakville. They are near, it, the properties are in near proximity to local transit services running on Randall and Church Street and within um, close proximity to the GO station in Midtown. Down, downtown Oakville, as we know, is identified as a growth area in the Livable Oakville plan and is one of the key areas for development and redevelopment to accommodate intensification within defined growth areas. The subject's lands are now designated urban core within livable Oakville. And the area is intended to be a pedestrian, include pedestrian oriented amenities with wider sidewalks, additional street furniture and landscaping, um, and the built form is intended to have a high degree of transparency on the ground floor and contain commercial, community, cultural, or limited office uses on the ground floor um, and uh, a number of like upper stories, including uh, then residential above. Next slide, please. The subject lands are zoned CBD, which is Central Business District, in the zoning bylaw 2014-14. The applicant proposes to rezone the lands in accordance with the Livable Oakville Plan and OPA 20. From CBD to MU, MU4, which is mixed use four. <clears throat> mixed use four is in line with the urban core land use designation if, from the official plan. The applicant proposes a site-specific special provision that recognizes a few modifications to the parent MU4 zone. And the, um, I'll speak about those in just a little bit, but those uh, modifications are there to recognize the design of the site as they're putting forward at this time. I wanted to point out that this is standard practice uh, for the town to update the official plan when needed to conform to provincial mandates, policies, um, 
to stay consistent with population targets, new directions. And it is at that time that the developers of the properties apply for a zoning amendment when they are ready to uh, develop or redevelop their properties to implement the official plan policies and land use designations. The town doesn't typically go in and rezone the, pro the properties. Next slide, please. So the applicant has applied for a zoning bylaw amendment to facilitate a development application as it's presented in the staff report, a 12 story mixed use commercial office residential building with ground floor commercial and retail space, office space on the second and third floors, 144 residential units and three levels of underground parking with 288 parking spaces. Zoning bylaw 2014-14, as I mentioned, um, it, 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 it is a CBD zone which permits a range of uses, which is consistent with the proposal. However, it had a maximum height of 15 meters, which, which is typically four stories. This 2014-14 um, predated the increased height provisions established by OPA 20 and that is identified on the OPA schedules Q1 that I showed earlier. As you can see on this slide, <clears throat> excuse me, the darker gray illustrates the ground floor plan of the proposal. At the top of the slide is Randall Street and the green arrow indicates where the proposed vehicle access and exit would be located to the underground garage. Currently there is an existing laneway that comes off of Church Street that is shown with the slimmer green arrow and is proposed to function as an emergency only access as well as for pedestrians. If there are questions tonight um, with regards to how the applicant sees these, uh, this access working, I'd ask that the applicant address these questions directly. The hatched shaded blocks indicate existing buildings that are not included in this proposal. The laneway off of Church Street does provide access to the parking at the rear of the community living building. The yellow arrow indicates a pedestrian access for the tenants of the office space above the ground floor. And the blue arrow points to the pedestrian access and lobby area for the residential component of the development. The commercial units are all proposed to have street access points along the sidewalk. Next slide, please. Okay, I want to clarify about this. It has come up a little bit um, because I did include it in my staff report um, and it does not look exactly like the uh, proposal that's in front of us. So I wanted to clarify. In um, this model was put together by staff in 2019 uh, before the actual application was submitted. And staff incorporated a conceptual 3D model of the proposal into the model of the downtown. This was uh, early stages. Uh, when staff were working with the developer and working out site logistics and built form, it does not represent the finished elevations that are before us tonight. It merely, um, in my mind, it represents a 12 story building within the context of the downtown area. And to be honest, I was having network issues this morning and wasn't able to grab a hold of anything updated to put into my presentation today. The subject uh, application is consistent, as I said, with the CBD zone in terms of the use uses. Um, however, with OPA 20 and the introduction to, of a maximum building height of eight to 12 stories in the urban core land use designation, the applicant proposes to amend this zoning from CBD to MU4, mixed use four, in order to implement the livable Oakville urban core policies. Next slide. This is a view, current view, of the proposal from Randall and Navy intersection that shows the proposed active uses along the ground, ground floor. You can see the transparency that I spoke to earlier with regards to urban core uses in the downtown or any type of main street uses for that matter in the downtown. Um, we want a transparency on the ground floor that uh, promotes activity. It also uh, demonstrates some of the step backs above the fourth floor. Next slide, please. This is um, this is a bird's eye view of the massing of the entire block 
with the proposed development. So you can see the proposed development. This is like it, Randall's at the bottom of the screen here. This is looking at it kind of from the intersection of Randall and Thomas. So you can see the massing of the proposed building along with the existing buildings. Um, and again, uh, 156 Randall Street is under construction. Next slide, please. And this is another view um, of the elevation from Randall Street. Um, it shows some of the step backs that are proposed um, from the east side. So facing 156 and some of the existing commercial buildings that are along Thomas Street. Next slide, please. The applicant proposes the following modifications to bylaw 2014-14. The top four rows in the darker color indicate a true modification from the current MU4 zone within 2014-14. So specifically with regards to setbacks for front yard and flankage yards. We have some setback uh, requirements in the zoning bylaw of one meter and um, minimum front, five meter maximum front. They're looking for zero um, within their special provision. Also with their flankage yard, it's the same one meter uh, minimum, five meter maximum flankage yard. They are also asking to build up to the property line. So those are the true, oh, sorry, it's not, it's not showing up the color, uh, coloring the top four uh, for the top four rows. Those are the true modifications that they are looking for at this point. The bottom four rows are here to illustrate the difference between the existing CBD and the existing MU4. So the bottom four rows show that in the existing CBD, there's a, you know, a, a minimum height, minimum stories of two stories, where in the existing MU4 in bylaw 2014-14 is eight, and so on, a maximum of four, and in the existing MU4, it's 12. When you go over to the special provision and the requests that um, this bylaw is coming in with, they're keeping with, they're in keeping with the existing MU4. So this wouldn't necessarily be included in the bylaw. I am just showing it because it, it, is, some, it is taking some people by surprise that um, it is a big jump from two to four stories to go to eight to 12 stories. However, it is, in, it is consistent with current zoning for the MU4 for four zone. Next slide, please. Okay, the following, um, following reflects the issues and the matters that have been identified to date by staff for further review and consideration. So we always have the consistency with provincial policy statement um, and the conformity to the 2019 growth plan, uh, conformity to the region of Halton official plan and um, the conformity with livable Oakville policies, including whether the proposal has an appropriate scale, height and massing for its context. Compliance always with the livable by design guidelines, parts A and C. Again, including scale, massing, appropriate existing and proposed separation distances and shadow impacts. Um, question that's being asked among staff is, does the proposal meet the intent of the height permissions approved in OPA 20? And um, for example, what I'm saying here is, will the proposed series of building step backs contribute to preserving the existing and future built form of the surrounding properties as is and in the future? So as not to preclude any type of development on the other properties, um, shadowing impacts, views, that kind of thing. Evaluation of the redevelopment potential of the surrounding properties, compatibility of design and proposed materials with the downtown Oakville Heritage Conservation District, suitability of the proposal in terms of the conservation of heritage district resources that are adjacent to the proposal. Uh, question, will the building contribute to the public realm along Randall, Navy, and Church Street? And does the treatment of the ground floor enhance the private, the public-private interface? Justification, justification for the proposed modifications to the parent zoning. Assessment and suitability of the proposed emergency shared vehicular access onto Church Street. 
establishment of appropriate parking standards for residential parking, including visitor parking. I would like to say that in the downtown mixed use zones, there is no requirement for commercial and or office parking. Establishment, oops, sorry, I already did that one. Uh, assessment of the transportation impacts to the existing road network. Alignment with the climate emergency declared by council in June of 2019. Next slide, please. So the following is a list of comments that have been submitted to date um, by the public. Uh, and I just want to say before I go through them, these comments, uh, a lot of some of them just came in today. And these comments will be included in upcoming uh, review discussions and or working sessions that staff plan to have with the applicant and their dis and their consultant team. And they also will be addressed in the future recommendation report to Council. So comments being raised so far uh, have included height and massing, um, a feeling of an overbuild of the site. Uh, why? was the height change from four to 12 stories, negative impacts to the historic downtown core, concern over the protection of downtown heritage resources, adverse impacts to adjacent properties, including separation distances to allow for privacy views, landscaping and sunlight, size of residential units, timing of conducting the traffic study, which was March, 2020. So, that is something we need to assess. Uh, staff need to sit down and, and talk about, uh, you know, it was right at the time where the private schools go on March break, the public schools a week later, and then COVID. So the, the concern is that it wasn't exactly the appropriate time. And is there, um, there's no way to redo it at this point with what we're dealing with, with COVID. So is there an opportunity to use potentially um, town, generated traffic data. Traffic congestion, air and noise pollution. What type of monitoring will be in place to assess the impact of a building this size? And it wasn't clear if this comment was with regards to traffic congestion or if potentially they were looking at some other types of impacts, but uh, I took it as traffic. Parking rates per use, vehicular access to the building. Will the town be approving one entrance exit to the underground garage for all uses? Conflict raised with the emergency pedestrian access off of Church Street and a comment received that this would be a beneficial development to the downtown, especially with the mix of uses. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, staff put forward the following recommendation as shown for Council's consideration uh, that comments from the public with respect to the zoning bylaw amendment application by Randall Oakville Developments and Church Oakville Developments be received. The notice of council's decision reflect that any comments received from the public will be appropriately addressed and that the planning report dated October 14th be received. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Collingwood. Um, council, would you like to hear the registered delegation from Trafalgar Trotwell Residents Association next and, and then take your questions and any additions you have to the issues list after the benefit of hearing from the TCRA. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you call the uh, registered delegation, uh, Ms. McMinn, the president of Trafalgar Chartwell? Carolyn McMinn, president of TCRA, is our first delegation on this item. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, could I please see the presentation so that I can talk through it? So tonight I'm delegating on behalf of both the Trafalgar Chartwell Residents Association and the Oakville Lakeside Residents Association, um, except that I didn't put their name on the, um, on the presentation. Next slide, please. So I'd actually like to start this evening by thanking Mr. Terence Glover from Urban In Mind for hosting the public information session on Zoom on September 17, and then subsequently answering the questions or attempting to answer the questions that we raised in the meeting, um, and also for forwarding his presentation to us because that's been very useful um, in terms of developing our presentation tonight. Um, and as I've already said, I'm uh, here with George Niblock representing both uh, residents associations. Um, we have three main concerns, uh, which is shadowing, traffic, and the MU4 Special Zoning Amendment. 
Can I have the next slide, please? So the proposed building is uh, designated as the growth uh, area urban core, which is where 12 storeys is allowed. Um, and we actually quite like the design with the step back uh, facade, which does help to mitigate the height and massing on the site. Although it should be pointed out that the mechanical room is not shown. And for a building with 144 residential units, three floors of office space, commercial units down the bottom and 281 car parks, the mechanical room will be quite sizable, possibly at least another four meters in height. Um, but we also acknowledge that this mixed use building will attract people to live, work and shop downtown and will help revitalize our CBD, which I think is a very, very important um, thing to do. Can I have the next slide, please? With regards to the shattering concerns, uh, without the mechanical room, the building will be at least 42 metres in height. Um, it's on two very, very busy corners in Oakville and the shadowing from the 12 storey development will be an issue for the surrounding properties. The shadow analysis, which was conducted by Brooke McElroy, concludes that there's adequate sunlight for the residences facing Randall Street on April 21st, June 21st and September 21st. However, there are seven months from September 21st until April 21st. So therefore we must conclude that the fall and the winter months will not provide adequate sunlight for those residences. Therefore, it will make the corner of Randall and Navy Streets very dark for most of the day in fall and winter as the sun rises later and sets earlier than it does in the spring and the summer. And I've got an illustration of that on the next slide, please. As you can see, the sun, as the sun moves round from, from the east round to the west, the shadowing, and it will, it will move from the corner of Navy and Randall Streets, but it will move all the way round to, Na to Randall and Thomas, and then eventually it settles on uh, sort of Church and Thomas. So for a large part of the day, the residences in Randall Street will actually be in shadow. Can I have the next slide, please? Our second concern was re regarding the uh, traffic study and um, Tricia uh, Collingwood has actually already gone through our points, but um, yeah, just to highlight that with the, the COVID uh, lockdown and the fact that um, the schools were all on March break and also the fact that Lakeshore Road was closed for reconstruction, so there was a subsequent rerouting of traffic as well. Uh, can I please have the next slide? On this, you can see the current parking ac access. So the one entrance and exit to the new mixed use building we think will be very problematic. Um, the surrounding intersection, especially the one um, at Navy and Randall, uh, will be compromised. Um, can you imagine if you're trying to race for the GO train and you're leaving that building and you've got someone ahead of you who wants to turn left onto um, Randall Street heading west and there's only one entrance lane, one exit lane. Um, the other thing that will happen is a lot of people will exit that car park and turn to the right and head to the east towards Trafalgar Road and will then turn left at Trafalgar and uh, I think it's Thomas, um, no, sorry, Randall and Trafalgar, what am I saying? And will then head north towards the GO train and the QEW 403. Um, so again, that's going to cause a substantial tailbacks, especially in the mornings when most people are leaving to drop kids at school and work somewhere between the hours of half past seven um, and half past eight, nine o'clock in the mornings. Um, we'd like to point out that the streets here are not designed to handle this extra volume of traffic. Um, and what happens here will actually set a precedent for what happens with any future development of any of the future sites, future development sites that are located within this vicinity. You can also see that there's the emergency exit um, or entrance onto Church Street. Um, and again, that's meant to have pedestrians as well. So we also question whether that would be safe, having that as the emergency exit and entrance. Can I have the next slide, please? So our suggestion would be <clears throat> that leave the exit onto Randall Street, but direct traffic to only be able to turn to the right, so, so to head east. And then to have a second exit um, onto Church Street, where the traffic again can only turn right, but this time they'll be heading west. And we think that will do a lot to mitigate any uh, tailbacks and, um, uh, and traffic issues and improve the traffic flow in general. And we also think that to maintain the emergency exit where it's currently um, go, slated to go uh, would 
would work. Can I have the next slide, please? With the MU4 special amendment, reducing the front and flanking yards from a minimum of one metre to, to nil so that it's right up against the property line, this will already crowd, this will, <clears throat> sorry, crowd the already crowded corners of Navy and Randall Streets and Navy and Church Streets, regardless of whether or not the, and this is a quote from um, the Urban in Mind presentation, whether or not the widened landscape pedestrian boulevard along Navy Street is built. And with all the extra traffic, this is only going to add to traffic woes because the roads will be narrowed if, if we're going to widen the boulevards. The building will set a precedent for how future development in this particular area, for example, the old fire station, proceeds. It is critical that we maintain attractive streetscapes, streetscapes sorry, with adequate space for pedestrians, outdoor patios, bike racks and entrances to the residences, offices and commercial businesses operating in this mixed-use building. Physical distancing due to the COVID-19 pandemic is here to stay for the foreseeable future. So this consequently requires additional space in all public locations, whether it be indoor or outdoor, uh, we, we need that extra space. Therefore, we believe that this amendment should be refused. Next slide, please. So our suggestions are that an additional two lane entrance slash exit to and from the car park onto Church Street will reduce the traffic issue. The traffic could be also be controlled by signs that would indicate a right slash east turn onto Randall Street only and a right or west turn only onto Church Street. This would involve uh, the loss of commercial and office space. However, the traffic issues would be eased and we believe you should keep the emergency exit in its current location. Next slide, please. In conclusion, this development will be precedent setting for the area. Therefore, we have to get it right. The TCRA and OLRA urges the Planning and Development Council to review the impact of additional traffic on the surrounding streets, to facilitate a second entrance and exit onto Church Street, and to refuse the site-specific zoning bylaw amendment MU4 special. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation, Ms. McKinn. Um, uh, Council, we also have Terence Glover available if you have questions, and staff, of course, is standing by to add any issues that you may identify that haven't already been identified. Councillor Duddick, your hand is up, and Councillor O'Meara, you're next. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I guess my question is, um, in regards to the heritage uh, component, will this application be circulated to Heritage Oakville for comments um, through this process? I have had it, the heritage impact assessment, sorry, through your worship, uh, Sue Shepard from um, the planning staff heritage has reviewed the application and the heritage impact assessment and is generally in um, generally receptive um, and okay with the findings of the um, the findings of the study. However, I'm trying to recall if she also said she was going to be taking this to Heritage. I can take this back and discuss with Sue. I would appreciate that. I've had several of, uh, as I dare say, Councillor Giddings has had as well, several members of our Oakville Heritage Committee saying, please tell me we get a chance to comment given the proximity of this to the Heritage um, designated properties. The other question I have, um, quite a few people were surprised in terms of the height restriction or the height uh, permissions being eight to 12. So, I mean, at the very minimum, you indicated eight. Now that was as a result of the OPA 20. Can you remind me, and maybe for the benefit of some of those at home who weren't as aware, it was quite a lengthy public process from what I recall where we had open houses and we had sort of a charrette process and a fly through the downtown Oakville area to see where if we were to increase densities or heights um, where we could do that and I seem to recall bookends from either end of the particular downtown core. The um if I recall correctly, the downtown transportation and streetscaping study and the cultural hub study and all that work that was underway and with the charrette started in 2014, I believe. 
Um, they work with policy and OPA, uh, well, I don't know if it was ter referred to as OPA 20 at that time, but um, they did start their work and analysis. I, the I feel was 2017, the OPA was brought forward and what I believe was 2018, and it wasn't approved by the region until 2019. Um, however, there was extensive, uh, if Mark wants to add in, there was extensive um, public input, as you said. There was numerous public uh, sessions held uh, downtown and then uh, downtown and at town hall. Um, and uh, it, it was, it has a, a widely, um, subscribe to um, site on the town of Oakville website for notification on any changes. Uh, so yeah, I believe it's it has been in the approval stage for a couple of years, but finally approved last year by the region. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Councillor. The planning director would like to add something to this point. Mr. Simeone. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through to the Councillor. Just, I happen to have the listing of the meetings, so I'll just make council fully aware of them. Started on November 23rd, 2015 with the public open house. And then we sent out to our email, uh, people who signed up for the OP review, an email blast. We extended the comment until February of 2015. March 31st of 2016, uh, there was a stakeholder workshop where all the heads of the uh, rate pairs or associations were invited. I think it was the Pine Room at the, at the arena. I attended that meeting as well. Um, April 26th, there was an information night here, and I think it was in the, the Oak Phil Trafalgar room, or one of the rooms downstairs. Again, that was uh, an evening where we did the three-dimensional fly-through, and we had people with the clickers, and they were able to vote on certain, certain heights and, and all of that. Um, May, May 2016, um, there was an online survey with the 3D computer model, and people were able to respond to that. On March the 6th of 2017, there was a public information session to prevent the draft policy changes. On June the 12th, 2017, um, through the Livable Oakville Steering Committee, there was a public meeting with respect to this item. Uh, finally, there was a meeting October 11th of 2017 and approval by council following in December of that year, and then off to the region for their final approval. Thank you very much for that uh, outline. It's very beneficial. Thank you, Councillor Dudek. Um, I'll turn now to Councillor O'Meara. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The presenter, I believe Carolyn, had mentioned in her slides that the roads um, cannot handle that added traffic. I'm just wondering if uh, she might be able to share the data that she's got on that and where uh, where that information has come from. That would be beneficial to, uh, to us. Um, Ms. McMinn, uh, the councillor, perhaps you heard him. He's wondering uh, if you have a, a study or anything or you're just suggesting that the roads, what, what, what's the source of your information about the capacity of the roads? The source of my information is actually my own personal experience of having four children who play hockey, do karate, swim, um, you know, do, do a variety of sports, and I am forever driving up and down Randall Street. Um, and it, it, it can be, well, pre-COVID anyway, it can be an absolute nightmare and um, even getting to the vet or the doctors, which is down that way as well, um, at times we have to leave 10 to 15 minutes before I actually think we should in order to sometimes get through that stretch. Um, admittedly, it was made worse when the two bridges were being reconstructed, uh, which was in the last couple of years. Um, so no, there's no study, uh, but it is all having lived here in this um, particular place for six years now. It's, um, yeah, it can, it can be a real nightmare. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor O'Meara, did you have another question? Yeah, just, uh, just, just to follow up then. So uh, I guess if our staff can ensure that a, an independent, validated look at traffic capacity on that road can be done to address uh, comments. Um, obviously, I mean, we all have anecdotal evidence on stuff, but if we can get an independent assessment on the traffic impacts that would be uh, beneficial. Thank you, Your Worship. Sure, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Ms. Collingwood's already indicated that staff are looking for ways to compensate for the uh, the difficulty of measuring traffic during COVID, which uh, appears to be I'm pretty sure is going to be with us for a while in terms of that impact. Councillor Giddings, I see your hand. You're next. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Collingwood or Planning Director Simeone, uh, just out of curiosity, you mentioned the uh, growth area as a growth node in downtown Oakville. Uh, number of people, number of residents have reached out concerned about that terminology and they, they envision a, a downtown Burlington or Port Credit. Just for clarity, are you able to provide uh, context for that in terms of uh, the possible numbers that would be anticipated? Through your worship to the councillor. So it is in fact a growth area is identified in the, uh, the Bullockville plan and part of the town's recently adopted urban structure. Um, there's one of we have many growth areas, Kerr Street, Bronte area, uh, Trafalgar Corridor, Midtown, as you know, and of course, downtown uh, Oakville. When we looked at it uh, through that process I described earlier, um, there's a number of constraints that you have to be mindful of with respect to development in the downtown. There's the heritage conservation districts that surround essentially the downtown, and then there's a the stability of residential neighborhoods which also surround the downtown. And of course, you have the, the creek, which is, acts as a, as a natural barrier to development. So there's a limited number of sites. When we looked at it, although there was an interest in certain sites achieving the 12-story uh, the maximum, uh, not all of them can receive that by virtue of the constraints I've identified. So there is the protection of the neighborhoods that surround the downtown. There's the conservation districts. The numbers were limited. I don't have a number off the top of my head, uh, but I recall a number of something like 1,000 new residents may be an upper limit potential to reside in the downtown based on some of the permissions. I can get back to you on that for the, uh, for the recommendation report. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Collingwood, further to the parking, uh, we will often receive numbers in terms of how many parking spaces per unit are being uh, planned. In this case, we've got residential units, we've got commercial units, uh, we've got potentially retail units at grade uh, with the total number of spaces is that just for residential are you able to comment on that i have through your worship i am able to comment on that the uh we don't have a definitive answer that was included in the planning justification report or uh, the transportation impact analysis it is something we're going back to the applicant on so they are including about a hundred additional spaces than what is required however there's no breakdown for how they see that happening and that that sometimes is often the case during the rezoning because the rezoning is really setting the building footprint and the uses the form um we we hammer out a lot of the uh, ratios and the details through the site plan however in the bylaw we will make sure minimum parking uh, numbers are respected so if we can work with the applicant a little bit further to get a better sense of the sizing of units, um, the type, uh, bedroom type of the units, as well as um, the expected uses on the ground floor in the office, there, there will be some ways where we can um, discuss parking utilization and an appro appropriate count for this uh, development that would be included in the bylaw as a minimum. All right, thank you, because there are 144 units planned with 281 parking spaces. Um, I'd be curious when, when they come back to, to or when the uh, proponent speaks a little later to see if that's two, two parking spaces per unit. And uh, my concern is that uh, we use a, a current availability in terms of parking spaces. Uh, for you know, rather uh, difficult downtown at, at times. Uh, when OPA 20 came through, is this the kind of development that was anticipated by taking three properties and amalgamating them and, and putting that together? Through you, Your Worship. We, um, when OPA 20 came through, it was, uh, the thought was, um, that properties would have to be assembled to allow for a 12-story building. Um, the, what's in question right now is the intent of that 12-story building. Was it a, what is the massing that is coming forward now in this proposal what was intended or was it intended to 
Um, were we looking more to have a slender tower uh, element on top of a four-story podium? And, and is, are the three properties enough? Um, are, are they the appropriate size now that we have it, or now that they have the three properties, is it an appropriate size for this type of massing? Or do we need to further look at the step backs that I was showing you earlier um, to, to ensure that the form is um, slender enough to allow for the views, the shadowing concerns that we do have that are coming out through the shadow study. Um, and I will say the comments are that the shadow study does need to be redone um, to better look at uh, the months in between the what what they've captured. There's there's several months that you know it's sort of glossed over. It doesn't follow the terms of reference by the town, so that will be looked at. Through that. We anticipate that the building may take on a bit of a different form because of the adverse impacts that the massing is showing right now. However, those discussions have not been had yet so that we have a working session to work those out. All right. Um, the, the slide that you showed earlier in terms of uh, the older uh, sketch, if you will, looking at, uh, I believe it's 155 maybe to the north, that is 12 stories as well, I believe. And was your picture fairly accurate in terms of the height difference between the 12 stories at 155 and, and the proposed 12 story? Something is off in that perspective. I can't okay. say exactly what it is, so I'm not sure. However, it is definitely, I, I wish I had been able to pull up a better image today um, because that is definitely not a, true, a good depiction of the height. I mean, the, the 12 stories is 12 stories. We're not going over any uh, above, uh, above and beyond um, what a typical 12 story building would be. And I'm not sure the height in metrics of the existing building, but this one would not tower over it like it shows in that slide. All right, and in the comments uh, from the proponent uh, on page 33, it states that Terrence clarified that bonusing will not be required due to the fact that the proposal is bringing zoning into conformity with the official plan. Could you just uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Through your worship, uh, bonusing is not eligible on these lands. So I, I'm not really sure where that comment was coming from, but it's, it, it's not something that's even a discussion point. Fair enough. And last question, uh, in terms of traffic, on one of your slides, you had the, the emergency exit onto Church, uh, the primary exit onto Randall, and a yellow and blue arrow off yes. of AV. And could you just elaborate on that a little bit, the, uh, from Navy? Through your worship, uh, the yellow arrow is um, the entrance for the office employees, for the tenants, for those office units that are um, on the second, third, and even potentially the fourth floors. The blue arrow is to the residential lobby and accessing the residential space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, let's turn now, uh, Councillor hazlitt Deal. Welcome to the uh, question period. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Thank you, Ms. Collingwood, and, and thank you to TCRA and OLRA for a really good overview of some of the resident concerns. Um, I do have a few questions that uh, of um, the applicant, but I just wanted to clarify a few things um, that I've heard. Um, there was a comment, um, Ms. Collingwood, you said about commercial uh, units and parking. Um, are you saying that we don't have a standard that requires parking for the commercial use of the building? Through your worship, in the, da in the mixed use zones in bylaw 2014-14, there is no uh, requirement, there's no minimum requirement for parking for anything non-residential. So residential is completely spelled out, broken out by you know 20 different possibilities uh, for parking ratios. Anything non-residential does not have a minimum parking rate. So in looking at putting together the bylaw for this um, 
development, they are proposing about a hundred extra additional spaces. It will be it will be something we need to look at and how we ensure that um, it's not all residential. Um, that we are accommodating uh, all uses in some way, whether it's some car share, um, spa a shared spacing, um, and. Um, I know there are some concern about taking up parking in the downtown streets. And so we have to be, um, we have to be careful with the way we, we look. If they have the space, um, at which they're showing they do, to uh, provide for additional parking, we need to look at how we can accommodate parking for all uses. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Because um, I think you've uh, very clearly understand the concern, which is we cannot lose parking um, uh, with the addition of this commercial uh, mixed use if, if it moved forward. Uh, we need them to contribute to um, uh, parking uh, for downtown um, and, and for their, their tenants because their tenants will be much more attracted uh, by having access to, to the parking. Um, it, I was, it wasn't clear to me about the width of the sidewalks and the setbacks. So, um, uh, is the sidewalk width that they're proposing um, identical to what Paradiso has um, on that uh, other corner? Through your worship, I am not able to zoom in enough here. I'm trying um, to see. Oh, wait one second. No, I'm sorry. It's it's not coming through clear. It is something I'm going to have to take back. I do know that what we're looking through through the downtown transportation streetscape study, we are looking at a uniform streetscaping throughout the downtown. So we will be conforming to that streetscape study, streetscape study which um, would, would allow for and require the same width of sidewalking um, and uh, landscaping. Um, any kind of public realm amenities, it would require the same uniform look throughout the downtown streets, depending on which street you're on. But mostly, it's like a lakeshore model. Okay. So, so I can, you. I can, I can take that back and and let you know what the width is, unless um, when Terrence gets on, he knows. Okay. Um, uh, I'm I'm just wondering about this request for zero setbacks. Um, have we ever done that in downtown Oakville at this point? Through you, your worship, um, it is something that uh, 109 Randall's, Randall is looking at. Um, several, several applications come in and they ask to build up the property line because um, it depends on the site they have. If it's commercial, they want to meet the, they want to meet the property line. They want to be able to address it right as much as they can. Um, it, it is something that we are in, consistently asked to do. And it is something on the site that we will be taking a close look at um, if even the one meter is enough um, and how we want to proceed. Okay. Um, in your report, you talk about the importance of having a high quality architectural and urban design. Um, but when I'm reading the applicant's planning justification report, he, there's uh, terms like, uh, quote, adequate sunlight and no intolerable effects. Is, is that what you meant by exploring, um, of having further conversations about design and about the shadowing and about the setbacks? Through you, Your Worship, the comments that I received from Urban Design and the ones that uh, are coming out um, just in reviewing it myself, we do have concerns obviously with the shadow, with views, with space for landscaping, um, privacy for the existing um, uses that are on the street now as well as future uses so we need to look at separation distances um, and so we're not precluding anyone's view or access to sorry got a dog um, access to <laughs> access to to sun and, uh, sh and uh, limiting shadow so <laughs> so we do with this is something we're taking back um, we are taking a look at it with urban design staff and the applicant. We are going to be scheduling a working session with them because it's, it's, this is the type of development where you want to sit down staff and everybody at the table to sort of hash out some of these issues and, and maybe 
pen to paper and start sketching out what you can, uh, making improvements because this is not the site to start looking at tolerable or adequate. Um, and we do have concerns about this being a precedent site in the downtown. And it's, it's this kind of site that it has to be done right. Okay. Not that any site shouldn't be done right. This site is a big one. Okay, so thank you for that. Gives me a lot more um, confidence and heart that we're, we're headed in um, looking at a more holistic approach to that site as it, as it uh, and the public realm around it and including Centennial Square, because Centennial Square has, uh, you know, potential development um, and, uh, and obviously we want things to be complementary and thought in a more integrated way. Um, can you just confirm if the, uh, the Eastern property owner um, whose letter has been submitted, um, if there have been uh, discussions in terms of an assembly of the properties? <laughs> through, through you, Your Worship, I do understand that the applicants, from what I've been told by the applicants, they have had conversations with the owners of the property to the east. I believed that they were ongoing, and that is something that uh, Terrence Glover could respond to. However, it, it's not a bad idea, um, and I hope that those conversations uh, continue. Um, but that's my understanding is that there have been some and they are ongoing. Okay. Um, can you just clarify for the public? There's a, there's a fair amount of concern about south of Lakeshore and um, uh, whether or not, uh, whether this got approved or not, um, the Im impact it could potentially have as a precedent for south of Lakeshore. In terms of the growth plan, OPA 20 and, and um, and all the work that was done um, over the last, uh, as, as Director Simeone said, the last few years, was there ever an intent to have higher buildings south of Lakeshore? Through you, Your Worship, um, I don't have the full, oh, maybe I do. I do have some of the full plan up here. Um, I am unaware of any intent to uh, place 12 story buildings along the south of Lakeshore. So OPA 20 is the latest amendment to conform to policy directive from the province, looking at our population targets. The adjustments were made um, and this site, as well as looking at the site to the north, which already has 12 stories and then Kitty Corner to um, town property are the only sites that have been looked at for eight to 12 stories at this time. I can't speak to 10, 20 years down the road. At this time, this is the uh, location for the height, which takes it out of the core on Lakeshore. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all the detail you have on the follow-ups because I think uh, it, it'll be an interesting discussion to try and, and have the best uh, design um, if, 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 if it were to move forward. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. All right, uh, Councillor Chisholm. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you, Trish, for the report. It, it's very uh, comprehensive and uh, it enlightens me on, on that whole uh, site. Uh, that's what's being uh, requested or proposal for amendment. My concern is this the 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 intensification and so forth we understand it but it seems to to me personally every time we intensify in some areas uh the idea is having uh transportation during a trans around a transportation node and people are going to walk to the go station or they're not going to be out of the car the reality of it is people are not getting out of their cars every time we build we're building as the cars come with it and this has always been the challenge and my concern is on page 17, it, there's a comment already made is that a future road widening would be required on Randall Street. Well, if you know Randall Street, if you're road widening, you're almost even going to be in the creek, uh, on the 16 mile creek. And there's also residential homes uh, still on Randall. And it's a very narrow roadway. Could we, as part of this development, as it goes down, uh, down the process, I would like to know what it's going to cost the taxpayer with respect to widening roads or changing things in order to have this type of uh, development uh, in this corner. Because it, it seems to be an assumption that if this massing happens of this building, we need to look at, at, the, at a traffic study, but a, 
above and beyond the traffic study is the impact of the, 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 uh, the road facilities themselves. Knowing full well, we've changed uh, from one way to two ways on Church and on Randall. And uh, just to give you my, my uh, personal opinion is that when it's sunny and a beautiful day, it takes you sometimes 10 minutes to get across the, the Lakeshore Bridge because people are coming downtown. The, the compression of uh, bringing in, in this area with vehicles is a real concern. And I think that's a concern that I think was expressed by the, the Residents Association and so forth. But I would really like to have part of this report is that whatever road widening or a road reconstruction is required because of this site and how that's going to impact on the taxpayer. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship, I would just add, um, there is, I believe it's 1.38 uh, meters, just looking at my notes, uh, road widening required. It is a long-standing requirement that is in the official plan um, for long-term widening of Randall down the road. Um, minor arterials typically have a standard of 26 meters. And I believe, if, I'm, if I can remember correctly, Randall's at like 15. It will never be a minor arterial in what we're looking at these days. It's going to be a downtown minor arterial. Um, the 1.38 is, like I said, it's, an, uh, it's a standing right-of-way um, requirement to keep the right-of-way consistent based on what, we, what has been taken along Randall already. Um, and then I'm not sure if that's then incorporated in the downtown transportation study streetscaping, if that's what we're looking at incorporating it with nowadays or not. And I will take that back and see if I can get a better answer for you. Um, thanks, Tricia. Just to give, give a, 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 I guess, a layman's way of looking at it, there are three homes on Randall that they're almost on, there's no setbacks in those homes. The sidewalks there and their, their their steps are right there. So I don't I don't understand how this is going to happen. You know, I think it's all inter interrelated with this development and how it's going to flow. And it, and it's not just starting at, starting at the site, but it'll go all the way down to Trafalgar and Reynolds on on the stops, the four way stops and the stoplights because it gets backed up already. And bringing in a um, a, a huge um, project like this is going to have major impact uh, in, in vehicles and the roadways. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. All right, uh, Mr. Planning Director, are you ready to summarize the any issues that have been identified to be added to your list? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a couple of opening comments. Uh, one is there was a, a comment from Councillor uh, Hazlitt Teal regarding development on Lakeshore. When we did the process, we looked at all our areas of the downtown. Lakeshore was, was modeled. We looked at different building heights, and it was decided that was not an appropriate place to increase height. Uh, two main reasons. One is they wanted to maintain the pedestrian scale and walkability of that, of that part of Lakeshore. And of course, south of there, you're into a residential neighborhood. So there was no desire to increase heights in those locations. That's my memory of that study. I just wanted to be clear about that. The other issue I wanted to make uh, you aware of, the, when we looked at the Lakeshore, the town did look at all the streets and how they all come together and work together. And those matters can be reported on uh, in the report as we go forward. Um, I did, I want to point out that on page 21 of the report and back part a little bit on page 22, uh, Trisha has summarized nicely the issues that staff will look at. Many of the issues that were, were here were also raised by members of council, but I do note some unique ones and I'll just go them, through them briefly. Uh, number one, how many more residents or units can be accommodated in the downtown based on OPA 20, Official Plan Amendment number 20. Staff had a report back on the height of the proposed building. I think we're looking at a specific number here, so we'll get that for you. Staff to consider an appropriate parking standard for the non-residential uses and the residential uses. In other words, how is the parking going to work? Staff had a report back on the proposed sidewalk widths and the adequacy of the sidewalk in, the, in this location. Staff had a report back on whether or not a zero meter setback has been approved elsewhere in the downtown, so we'll dig that up for you. Uh, lastly, what will the cost be to the town with respect to road improvements as a result of this proposal? All right. Now, uh, Madam Clerk, one more matter. Uh, excuse me, Councillor O'Meara. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Worship. Sorry, I just wanted to add there, um, we've heard a lot about precedent and what precedent this sets. I'm wondering if staff might be able to report back on 
precedent issues because I was always of the understanding that, um, in particular, when issues go to the LPAT, that precedent doesn't matter and they look at it as a case by case basis. So, uh, if staff might be able to report back on what precedent or rules precedent has, uh, I'd appreciate that as well. Thank you, Councillor. So, now there's one more matter uh, of Councillor Lischina. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm assuming it's part of the, the uh, statement about climate change and um, Council's, uh, uh, I guess, willingness to go and, and make sure that whatever is being built in the future is adapting to uh, the climate. So there's EV charging stations part of this uh, parking. Is there any other things considered? Through you, Your Worship, I haven't gotten that far into this proposal about how they will conform to it. Uh, the EV charging stations are something that I'm really keen on and we have been making sure are part of, um, are part of the underground uh, development um, rough-ins. Uh, the developer often doesn't want to put the full infrastructure in, but will rough it in for us. There will be the uh, green terraces and a lot of the developers now are looking at what type of lead building standards they can go for. So we will be having conversations with the developer. Maybe the applicant can respond when he comes on to that with regards to how they propose to uh, be in compliance, but it is something that we need to dig a little deeper on. Thank you very much. All right. So I'll try one more time. There's one more matter then, and that is to... Uh, ask the applicant's agent who registered as a delegation if there are any points uh, that uh, they would like to add to your consideration at this point, given that this is a, you know, as we've explained, an information or issue gathering session rather than a final decision session. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you check with the, the applicant, see if he wishes to uh, delegate? Uh, uh, hello, yes, I do. He's, he's actually here. Hello, uh, Mr. Clover. Hello, how are you? Uh, you have the Zoom, as we say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council, for allowing me to, to speak here. Um, questions, discussions about um, what this development is. And I had prepared and submitted a presentation. Um, it's essentially a recap of the public consultation, which I think most of you have seen a copy of anyways. But I would like to, to go back and, and go over some of the staff's um, comments and their presentation, just to clarify, and also resolve some of the questions that were brought forward. Um, actually, if we could go to staff's presentation, uh, Ms. Collins. Sorry to confuse the clerk. Uh, this is a last minute <laughs> issue. I just thought it was probably more appropriate than going over everything that we already know um, to talk about the issues that were outstanding. If we could go to figure number three, which is on page eight, your staff's presentation. There we go. That one there. So uh, as was pointed out by one of the councillors, the, the apartment building uh, right next to them is 12 stories, and our building is 12 stories. So they will be the same height. Uh, whether the apartment's wrong or ours is wrong, uh, they will be the same height. So this really throws off the scale and puts a negative impression of what we're actually proposing here. Um, this building that's shown here is, is far larger than, than what's actually proposed. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and then on page number 10, that one there, this one here is, is, in my opinion, is unfair as well because it shows the solidness of a building where it doesn't include glazing, doesn't include features uh, and architectural details that we do to soften the building. This is basically a Lego block building and it uh, doesn't really represent what you'll feel on the ground. Um, okay, if we could go to, if we could go to uh, the old, just an overall aerial photo of the property. Sure, that's great. Um, so I'd just like to point out that we have had a traffic consultant um, uh, um, look at the property and the data that was used from the traffic consultant in the traffic report was actually taken uh, November, December 2019 and the data uh, data. 
So it wasn't done in March break. It wasn't done during COVID. Uh, the data was actually from before that period. Um, the report itself was presented in March. So, so there should be no issues with the data and the data actually is from the city as far as I understand it. Um, so that should be pretty legitimate. And that report suggests that the roads, uh, the level of service of the roads um, are under capacity and can accommodate this development. So there should be no negative impact as a result of this development on the local roads. Um, in terms of the, the discussions about uh, right turn only, uh, we're open to having discussion with staff about how best to accommodate the traffic. The, the report uh, says one thing, but staff may have another opinion of how things should work. And uh, we're open to that, obviously. Um, the shadow study, um, we, again, we've had our professionals look at that, that study and typically you take three points of the year. I appreciate that it may not meet the total standards of the, um, um, uh, the region and the city's preference on how it should be done. So we'll go back and look at that and, and prepare uh, the proper shadow study um, in terms of the masking and that. So that, that's not a problem. Um, so uh, a concern that was raised about the, the road widening. And I'd just like to point out that the road widening is not in no way, shape, or form a result of this development. The road widening has been set by the city prior to this development, before they even anticipated what would be here, uh, as required for the width of that road to operate at a level of service that's acceptable in future anticipated traffic. So, so that road widening is a result in what we have to deal with. We prefer to take no road, road widening at all. So if, if Kelsey's on board with that, for sure, take the road widening off the table. But as far as we understand it through staff, the road widening is required, and we have designed accordingly. Um, the, I'd just like to clarify, too, in my report, and it's my report for the plan justification, I use the words tolerable and adequate. And I use the term tolerable because, as council, as I'm sure you are aware, you cannot please everybody. And so when I use the word tolerable, it is, is uh, fully justified, fully explainable, uh, fully advantageous, but I'm sure someone will mean the word tolerable. I do not mean to try to fudge the system or a gray area or anything like that. It, it's just a, a, a term I use. I could have used any other to, to explain that, that although we've met all the requirements, it's, it's not going to make everybody happy as per the delegation that, that previously presented. Um, and adequate, again, adequate was just a, a term I used that it, it met the requirements. Uh, perhaps I could have uh, had a better choice of words. So I apologize for that. Um, the EV charging, um, of, of course, we would look at that under the previous building code, I think, I don't know if it's effective now, but under the previous one, you had to have 10% EV stations uh, physically there plus 10% roughed in. I think that was rescinded uh, by the current government, but nonetheless, as of today, I mean, you have to provide your tenants with what they want. Uh, electric vehicles are, are a coming trend. Uh, it would be silly for us not to include some kind of EV stations in our development. Um, the final point, if we could go to, uh, to the clerk, if we could go to the slide that has the proposed zoning on it. And even if you wanted to use my slide, that would be fun. Um, my slide is page 13 of my presentation, or the, the city staff has one as well on there. While we're there, I'd like to point out too that the, the heritage staff uh, have looked at, at this application and their common actually was no direct or indirect impacts to adjacent heritage properties at five, uh, 156 Randall, 134 Thomas, and 159 Church Street were identified. However, the following mitigation on table nine and 10 of their comments, uh, um, they're essentially uh, designing um, uh, stepped elevations and architectural details and things of that nature that, that we would look at. Um, and sorry, uh, page number 13 of my presentation. So in that regard, heritage has been examined and um, we feel confident that we've addressed the. Again, I'd like to summarize here as we're applying for a minor, sorry, we're applying for a zoning bylaw amendment. We're not applying for a site plan approval at this time. We're not applying for official plan amendment. We're not applying for subdivision or condominium at this time. Uh, this matter today before us is for zoning bylaw amendment. And we are currently in the CBD zone 
which allows zero front yard setback and allows for zero flankage yet setback. The MU4 zone, setback. so we could have easily just reframed this and said, you know what, we want to stay in the CBD zone, but we do a special zoning, and instead of four stories, we want to go to 12, which is in line and in conformity with your official plan that council approved and was approved at the regional level. So we've just chosen to go with the MU4 zone because that was the most appropriate zone that we felt would fit here. Again, we could rephrase this and repackage it and just go with the CBD zone that allowed for the increased heights. Um, and that is in conformity, in our, my opinion, with the official plan. So there's no issue there. The traffic and with, with architectural details and with, with shadowing and, and with um, you know, different ground floor aspects and parking, these are the issues site plan approval. And we have no problem dealing with them, revising the, the development, with uh, providing the, the meeting the staff's requirements and, and presenting a good project to council. Um, but today we're talking about the zoning bylaw amendment. And the only change that we're proposing, if you take away the actual MU4 and CBD zone, just the titles, the only thing we're proposing is change it to MU4 zone in order to increase the heights, which are in a conformity and reducing putting the setbacks back down to the CBD zone setback, which are zero. So again, all the details of the design, urban design, how it will look, how it will feel, we have no problem with that. But that's a, a topic for another day with another planning process. As long as within reason we get it right. Obviously, we have to provide parking uh, that meets the requirement, which we do. We have to provide setbacks and height requirements, and we have to provide um, um, you know, access that works. Um, but again, we're not setting the site up today. We, uh, we're just doing the zoning to set the use up. And I want, I don't want to distract from the point of how this will function or feel in, in the downtown core or whether you're setting precedent or not. All we're asking for is really to change the height, to make it conformity with your own official plan and to keep the setbacks at zero as what they are today. That's really the only difference of what we're doing. The dynamics of everything else are for another day, in my opinion. Uh, although they do have to be considered. As, as I'm not discounting them. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. All right, Council, I didn't hear any new issues to add to the list in that, but I heard some of your questions answered. Councillor Elgar, did you catch one? I just have a, a question of the uh, Mr. Glover uh, about parking. Could he explain a little more about the parking, how he gets 281 uh, parking spaces with 144 residential and then we're going to have three or four uh, levels of commercial and retail. I'm just trying to figure out how this all will gel. Mr. Glover, uh, are you prepared to have a early rehearsal of your site plan uh, application with the councillor here? Well, as with any, any uh any development downtown, uh, site plan is very important and, and the dynamics and how things work. So that, again, that's why we're not opposed to, to talking about those things. But uh, we do meet, our, our current proposed plan does meet the required zoning uh, requirements. Um, in saying that, we do have excess parking. Uh, how that parking will be uh, allocated uh, is, un is unclear at this time. We don't have that set out yet. Uh, it's too early in the process. Um, but we anticipate that we do have to provide tenant parking. We do have to provide resident parking. Um, and if there's any left over, either that would provide additional tenant parking for additional vehicles or provide additional tenant parking for customers, et cetera, or may even uh, uh, provide um, public parking. But again, it's, I'm speculating because it's far too early to, to identify that. We have to identify... Uh, some of the building design issues through site plan to see how it will work. Do we actually have 144 units or do we have 120 or whatever? Uh, will this impact our parking layouts? So again, it's again these are the issues that are resolved through site plan approval, not necessarily through figuring out if we can get zero one meter setback versus zero meter setbacks in four to 12 stories. Um, but it is something that we will be looking at with staff, and we are um, I'm sure we'll find a solution. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that. I guess we stay tuned. Thank you, Councillor, for understanding. Um, all right, um, I'd like a mover to um, um, set the additions to the list from uh, the planning director, uh, who's uh, Councillor Giddings, thank you. 
Is there any objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there is no objection, and the motion is carried. And Council, with that, we get to turn to our next public meeting report. Just like this last one, this is a issue identifying session, not a decision session. And if anyone is watching the live stream of this meeting on oakville.ca and you wish to speak to this item, you only need to call 905-815-6095 and we can connect you to the meeting. You'll be called upon to speak following the registered delegations. And the only registered delegation we have, Council, is uh, Constance Rattel, who's a planning consultant for the applicant. But Lee Musson is here, our senior planner, and uh, she has a, a presentation so that the public can be caught up to all that, uh, or at least get a taste of what Council already knows from its report. Lee, uh, uh, there you are. Uh, we look forward to your presentation, and uh, you have the Zoom now. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Good evening, Mayor Burton and members of Council. This evening you can find my staff report on page 35 of your agenda. Madame Joshua Creek Limited, phase four, has submitted a draft plan of subdivision and a zoning bylaw amendment applications to permit the development of 154 residential units and natural heritage system on approximately seven hectares of land. Again, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to introduce the application to Council and to the public and to obtain any further comments as related to the application. This report is to be received and no recommendations on the application are being made at this time. Next slide, please. The property is generally located on the north side of Dundas Street East and west of 9th Line. The legal description of the property is part of Lot 7, Concession 1, north of Dundas Street, and it's generally flat. These lands were previously used for agricultural purposes and the site is currently vacant. The subject lands were originally part of the larger Bressa subdivision but were removed due to the lack of servicing allocation. The proposed development is subject to the 2020 Regional Allocation Program and the developer has met the conditions and financial commitments as part of that program. Next slide, please. In terms of the surrounding uh, land uses, the subject lands are shown in red. To the south, east, and north is the Bressa Elpat draft approved draft plan of subdivision, consisting of detached dwellings, townhouses, and a uh, Dundas urban core block and two, st two storm water management ponds. Registration of a portion of the subdivision is expected within the next few weeks. The planning staff are also currently processing a site plan application on the portion of the Bressa Duck Block or the Dundas Urban Core Block, which is proposed to be developed for two 12 story mixed use buildings. West of the subject lands is the Argo Joshua Creek Draft Plan of Subdivision and Zoning Bylaw Amendment, which is currently under review. This application consists of detached dwellings, townhouse units, park, mixed use block, and a Dundas Urban Core Block. Next slide, please. In terms of the proposal, it relates to the redevelopment of approximately seven hectares of land. 154 residential units are proposed and natural heritage system. In terms of the breakdown of the units, there's 180 detached dwellings and 36 rear lane townhouse units. A condition of approval would require the conveyance of the natural heritage system to the town. This subdivision will assist in achieving a complete community in this location with the extension of roads and servicing between Bressa, Argo, and the Dun Oak lands. The proposed zoning would facilitate the development of the lands. Next slide, please. The North Oakville East Secondary Plan designates the subject property as neighborhood area and natural heritage system. The North Oakville Master Plan is intended to assist in providing guidance and coordination of local roads and adjacent land uses for the North Oakville planning area. Development applications are reviewed to ensure general coordination and consistency with the intent of the master plan. Minor modifications are permitted, provided the general intent and direction of the master plan is maintained. The lands are further identified as natural heritage system and general urban area. Next slide, please. The subject lands are currently zoned existing development or ED as illustrated on the slide on the left side of the slide. 
The existing development ED zone only permits uses that were legally existing on the date of the par uh, parent bylaw came into effect. The proposed bylaw would uh, anticipate a site-specific zoning, which would rezone the land from existing development ED to natural heritage system and to a site-specific general urban zone. Next slide, please. The applicant hosted a public information meeting in February of this year. One member of the public attended, as well as award six councillors. The residents inquired about timing and availability of units and location of the natural heritage trail system. Minutes from that meeting can be found in Appendix C of the staff report. To date, no written submissions have been received. Next slide, please. This slide reflects the various matters identified by staff to date. The future recommendation report will address a confirmation that the applicant is a member in good standing with the North Oakville East Developers Group, consistency with the provincial policy statement, conformity to the growth plan, regional official plan, and the North Oakville East secondary plan, coordination of the draft plan of subdivision with the environmental Im implementation study to the satisfaction of Conservation Holton in the town, conformity with urban design policies on matter, matters such as built form, lot sizes, transitions, compatibility with adjacent properties, interface with the public realm, and vehicular access, review of opportunities to provide on-street parking and investigate options to maximize visitor parking. Uh, an issue also raised is to investigate the feasibility of a street connection or pedestrian connection between this subdivision and the Argo subdivision to the west in the general location of the upper extent of Street A. This is a similar issue that was raised by Council when the Argo subdivision to the west was brought uh, forward about a month or so ago. Confirmation will also be uh, obtained with regards to appropriate road and lane widths to ensure functionality and any additional items identified by Council this evening or the public. Next slide, please. In conclusion, staff put forth the following recommendation for Council's consideration. Staff will be returning to Council with a recommendation at a future planning development meeting. This uh, concludes my presentation and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Musson. Uh, Councillor Adams is first out of the block and followed by Councillor Palmer. Thank you very much. I um, want to thank you for the list of items that are going to be reviewed, in particular the street uh, matrix plan and the connection point to, I guess it would be the northern wing of Street A uh, to, the, to the block to the west. I think that's an important element. Uh, without that, I think we would have a issue with uh, lack of access to the east-west. Uh, there's one other item that I'm not sure is really fully covered in the list, which is a transition to the Dundas block on the south end. And I wondered if staff could review the uh, appropriateness of the transition between the two blocks of land. Uh, through you, Your Worship, I, I can take that under advisement and uh, include that in the future recommendation report. Thank you. And I don't, so I don't know whether that means uh, consideration needs to be made with respect to these lands or with respect to the lands on the south side um, or a combination thereof. Through you, Your Worship, the, um, the zoning is in place for the Dundas Urban Core block to the south. Um, we're not the the, uh, the site plan that we're currently processing on that block uh, is, is in the I'm going to say the most southern eastern corner of the of the DUC block, um, and it doesn't extend to the to the north um, adjacent to the the residential I guess the common boundary. Um, when that site plan comes forward, we can look at and we will look at that that transition. Yeah, my, my understanding is that they have a multi-phase approach for that block of land uh, that they're proposing. And of course, the ones that are going to be in the backyards of the future residents will be the last ones built. And it's when everybody's moved in, that's when we're going to hear the, uh, the yells and screams of, hey, we don't want that, and we're not happy with that approach. Uh, and so uh, I, this is the point to try and be proactive around how that gets handled. But in any case. Um, thank you very much for the report. I did attend the um, public information meeting that was held by the applicant. Um, and of course, because this is a greenfield space, um, there's no residents immediately around it to bring attention to issues. But I think those will be issues that will come forward. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to second Councillor Adams that uh, it's once everyone's moved in that you hear the yells and the screams. It's something that we're certainly experiencing in Ward 7. Um, my question is around the uh, Rear Lane townhouse home. I just wanted to confirm, are there any private um, roads in the application? Uh, no, they're not. There is no condo roads proposed. Okay. Uh, it's just the rear lane townhouses that are along the uh, street A that's on the neighboring Bresla subdivision. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lischina. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Lee, for the presentation. Uh, could you comment um, regarding the natural heritage system? There'll be a trail network through that section? Through you, Your Worship, to the councillor. Uh, the natural heritage system that's on the most westerly side of this development is a realigned channel, um, which we call JC31. There is not a trail system proposed uh, through that through that area. It was not part of the trail, the master part, the park's master plan. Okay, so there will be no, uh, well, basically any enter entering points from any of the neighborhoods into that natural heritage system. There isn't a trail proposed through there, through the, the Parks Master Plan, no. Thank you. Councillor, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Elgar. Uh, thank you. Through you, uh, Mayor Burton. Lee, what's the proposed density of this, uh, this portion of the development? The, um, the official plan sets out densities uh, for the land uses, and for the most part, this is general urban. I don't have the range off the top of my head, but this does fall within that range. Which is what? I, I don't have What's the range? range? Oh, okay. I just wonder what the range is. I, like I said, I don't have it at the top of my head, um, but I okay. will make sure that it's included within the future staff report. Yeah, I, I'd appreciate that because I, I'm getting, it gets complicated now. If you go north of Dundas, it seems like medium density is 100 units per site hectare. And south of Dundas, it seems to be 50. And it's, it's Oakville, so like we have to get, I really feel we should have consistency with what we call medium density or whatever other densities we have as we go forward. So that, that's good. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, Council. Um, let's see if we've identified any issues. Uh, Mr. Planning Director. Thank you, Your Worship, to Council. Uh, Stafford to renew the appropriateness of the transition to the lands to the south being the Dundas urban core block and secondly staff to report back on the proposed densities in the recommendation report. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, do you want to just check and see if the uh, planning consultant for the applicant uh, has any uh, uh, anything to say at this point? I know she's available to answer questions. Uh, Constance, can you let us know whether you would like to speak or are you good? Hi, I have nothing to add. I just appreciate the comments so far and I'll continue to work with Lee um, to address the concerns, particularly the feasibility of the connection um, and anything else that's been mentioned tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Lischina, can I uh, assume that you're willing to move this item? Thank you. Councillor, is there any objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there is no objection and the motion is carried. We now come to our first discussion item, item number four on the agenda, and this is the Knox 16 Presbyterian Church Cultural Heritage Landscape Research Report. And we have a presentation from Susan Shepherd, the Heritage Planner. And if we just give her, a, I can see on my screen that it's being called up. So uh, stand by. We're about to uh, uh, share this information with the public so that they can catch up with where you are, Council. Ms. Shepherd, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship and members of Council. I'm so very pleased to be here uh, with you tonight to go through a good news report uh, for us about the Knox 16 uh, Presbyterian Church and Cemetery. Um, 
The property itself, as uh, I think many of you will hopefully be familiar with, is located right at the corner of Dundas Street and Lions Valley Park Road, uh, just before it goes down that very steep hill into um, Lions Valley Park. Uh, the property has been designated under the Ontario Heritage Act since 1978, um, but at that time, the requirements for heritage designation were actually quite different than they are today. And so um, we have actually taken the opportunity over the past couple of years to work with members of the congregation on bringing forward an update to that heritage designation bylaw to meet our current requirements, um, but to also provide a new uh, research report and a full analysis and assessment for the property. And through that process, um, it has been revealed that the property meets the criteria as a significant cultural heritage landscape. And so um, we have some excellent heritage conservation um, protection measures in the Livable Oakville Plan um, to protect and preserve cultural heritage landscapes. Um, this is uh, utilized through provincial legislative tools such as the Ontario Heritage Act, the Planning Act, and the Provincial Policy Statement from uh, 2020. I note that NOx 16 wasn't included in the original cultural heritage landscape strategy inventory that we undertook in 2015, but at that time we certainly did note that we would be bound to find properties over time that weren't included in that inventory that certainly could meet the criteria for a cultural heritage landscape, and we definitely have one here before us today. Uh, the research report that's attached uh, to the agenda package tonight is an incredibly thorough report that uh, was written um, by the town's um, heritage researcher, Elaine Eigel, uh, who does a tremendous job at diving deep into uh, heritage properties. And she has put forward um, a report that has assessed the Knox 16 Church and Cemetery as an organically evolved uh, continuing cultural heritage landscape. Um, it's a picturesque example of a mid-19th century Ontario Protestant church and cemetery, and, and it does retain an active social role in contemporary society as a place where the local Presbyterian community continues to practice its faith and commemorate its dead in the cemetery in ways that are closely associated with their traditional uh, way of life and of, um, of worship. Uh, Knox 16 articulates the almost 175 year evolution of this church and its congregation, as well as their spiritual and burial needs and practices. And as an active congregation, this cultural heritage landscape's evolution is still considered to be in progress. And so here we've got uh, an old map actually of what used to be uh, uh, known as the 16 Hollow Village or Proudfoot's Hollow. You can see there our little chapel circled at the top of the hill and then the, va the village itself was located down in that valley where that car is headed down that treacherous climb. The church itself is a lovely uh, red brick, uh, relatively simple structure. Um, and I must say also that uh, the congregation is also incredibly grateful for the town for its continuing commitment to the Heritage Grant Program as they have been the beneficiary of several years of the Heritage Grant Program to help keep their building um, in good condition. The proposed heritage designation that we'll eventually bring forward uh, for council to consider um, with the uh, approval of the congregation uh, also will include interior features of the church, including its wonderful uh, wood paneled ceiling and its uh, traditional lath and plaster walls. Here we've got a few shots of some of the older stones in the cemetery, which is a wonderful little spot to look around in if you ever get the opportunity uh, to, to go through it. Um, it's, it's certainly a wonderful piece of history that contributes overall to Oakville's um, a cultural heritage landscape as a town. At this time, we would recommend that uh, the Knox 16 Presbyterian Church and Cemetery move into the phase three of the cultural heritage landscape strategy implementation. And that would uh, be the process to undertake uh, the creation of a new uh, designation bylaw, as well as a conservation plan for the cultural heritage landscape. And we look forward to working on that with uh, the church congregation who are in complete support of what we've brought forward here today. And so the recommendation is to uh, endorse the cultural heritage evaluation report that's attached as Appendix A, and that Knox Presbyterian Church 16 and Cemetery uh, be recognized as a significant cultural heritage landscape and move into phase three, the implementation of protection measures. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ms. Shepard. Uh, Council, do you have questions? Councilor Elgar, and then Councilor Jenna. It's not a question. I just want to thank staff for the excellent report. I think this is amazing what they what they found here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I agree. It makes me proud to be a Presbyterian. Uh, Councilor Jenna. Uh, I agree. It's a beautiful site as well. Uh, just to, and I'm sorry if I missed this in the report, it's no longer an active burial cemetery. Is that correct? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, actually it is an active cemetery. There are still burial plots that have been purchased and are awaiting their recipients. Um, there are, I believe there are still open plots as well that have not been sold, um, and that all still goes through the church. So it is considered an active cemetery. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Um, we have no registered delegations. Is there a uh, member of the ward uh, possibly interested in moving this item? Councillor Grant, I saw your hand first. Um, Councillor Noll, your hand is still there. What would you like to say? I just want to also thank uh, the staff for this report. It's an awesome report. Uh, this is a very significant uh, uh, contribution to the historical um, preservation of North Oakville, the old Trafalgar Township. So I'm very excited uh, to see this progress, and I want to uh, give my deepest appreciation to all of the staff and consultants involved in the process. Thank you very much, Councillor Noel. Councillor Duddick, your turn. Thank you. Um, just sort of building on that, I'm very grateful that uh, Susan um, raised the issue of the Heritage Grant Program because quite often as members of council, you see it as a line item in a budget, but this is an example, a perfect example of where this money has gone to and has been very well invested in preserving our heritage. So good work. All right, thank you very much. It's uh, moved by, duly moved by Councillor Grant. Is there any objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there is no objection and Councillor Grant's motion carries. Council, our next discussion item is agenda item number five, the proposed regulation under the Ontario Heritage Act, Bill 108. We have a presentation from our uh, heritage planner, Susan Shepard. Ms. Shepard, uh, as we say nowadays, you have the Zoom. Thank you, Your Worship and members of council. I'm sorry this presentation won't be quite as uplifting as our last one, um, but it does contain some uh, very important information for us. Um, I think you'll remember that in May of 2019, the province released a housing supply action plan, um, as well as an update to the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. That came into effect on May 16th of 2019. Uh, Bill 108 was the direct result of the Housing Supply Action Plan. It's known as the More Homes, More Choice Act. And uh, it was a massive bill that proposed to amend 13 different provincial statutes, and one of those was the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, the Town of Oakville did provide uh, lengthy comments to the province on that bill, including a number of concerns about the proposed changes to the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, and some of those concerns were also related to questions about the uncertainty of what the regulations would be to go along with um, the, the changes to the legislation itself. Uh, while we certainly were expecting them to come along a little bit sooner, the regulations for the Heritage Act were not released until September 21st of 2020, and I'm sure this is in large part due to the ongoing uh, pandemic situation. Um, but the, uh, nonetheless, the comments uh, for the regulation changes are due to the Environmental Registry of the province on November the 5th. So we've taken this report through to Heritage Oakville already and we're here today to provide uh, you with some staff uh, commentary and recommendations on the proposed changes um, and then uh, to, of course, uh, uh, seek your resolution as well. I'd note that the Ontario Heritage Toolkit, which is really uh, kind of the user's manual to the Ontario Heritage Act, um, has not yet been released for comment. We've certainly heard that it is expected later this fall, but it's a really important document that makes um, 
the, the language that you see in the, the regulations themselves that were attached as Appendix A to this report, it puts them into a lot more user-friendly language. And so we are disappointed that we haven't seen it yet, and we feel it's an important piece of the puzzle to help everyone understand the new regulatory changes um, a bit better. Uh, this is just a summary of the changes of the regulations, and I'm going to go through them um, at one point at a time, so I'll just skip along rather than reading through a big list there. But uh, the first of the big changes is the introduction of new principles that need to be considered uh, when a municipality is making decisions about designated properties. And then that, um, those new principles include uh, a statement about the minimization of adverse impacts to the cultural heritage value of a property and to consider the views of all interested persons and communities when making those decisions. And it should be used in conjunction with uh, Ontario Regulation 906, which is the regulation that defines what cultural heritage value or interest actually is. I'd note that there are no changes proposed to that regulation itself. It's just that these new principles shall be used in uh, conjunction with that regulation in the town's decision-making process. I note that staff already use many of the similar principles to what the province has proposed in our own review process. However, we do have some recommendations um, uh, that, that we would like the province to consider. And so um, what we've noticed is that there is a difference in the, uh, the language proposed in the principle from what is included in the very new uh, provincial policy statement from 2020. And our um, recommendation is that that language, uh, the language in the principle proposed for the regulation to the Ontario Heritage Act should actually match what the PPS 2020 says. So the regulation states that property that is determined to be of cultural heritage value or interest should be protected and conserved for all generations. Whereas the provincial policy statement of 2020 states that significant built heritage resources and significant cultural heritage landscapes shall be conserved. We greatly prefer that language. They've also provided a new definition of adaptive reuse that's to be considered in the context of the principles. Uh, we're suggesting a, a minor change to that that says that uh, the alteration of a property of cultural heritage value or, or, or interest to fit new uses or circumstances while retaining the cultural heritage value or interest and the heritage attributes of the property. And so it's the underlined words there that we're proposing to be added to that definition. There will be new content requirements for heritage designation bylaws, and so you'll notice a change to how those bylaws will be written in the future. Uh, one is that uh, there will be, a, a, well, there is a proposed requirement to add a map or an image of the area to the actual designation bylaw itself. That's certainly not an issue for us to do because it's included in all of our reports, but we typically haven't included it in the actual designation bylaw because the land registry office itself does not prefer uh, image, images to be used due to the file sizes. And I believe that's something that uh, the province needs to work out with the land registry office. The new content for heritage designation bylaws also requires that the description of heritage attributes of a designated property must be brief, but also explain how each attribute contributes to the cultural heritage value or interest of the property. While we're happy to do that, we do note that the requirement for explanations may make the description then less brief, but we'll do our best. The new designation bylaws can also include any features of the property that are not considered heritage attributes. Um, and actually, this is quite helpful, and we've done this in the past through an explanatory note within a heritage designation bylaw, um, but this would actually make it uh, the content of the body instead, which is perfectly fine. One of the new requirements is that there is now a 90-day timeline um, to issue a notice of intention to designate um, from uh, a list of prescribed circumstances, which include the submission of a complete planning application. Um, and so there are a number of exemptions to the 90-day timeline, which we are very pleased to see, because we do actually have a number of developers who are will very willing to work with staff in the town to conserve important and significant cultural heritage resources. 
And so uh, one of these exemptions is through mutual agreement between the town and developers, and we hope that that will be used uh, fairly often. There's another exam exemption um, for the introduction of new and relevant materials, which is helpful to ensure that all parties have all of the information that, need, that is needed to make a decision. But our concerns lie in the fact that there is not enough time for the town to request and review a peer review of a heritage impact assessment that we do not feel meets the town's requirements. And so we would recommend that the 90-day timeline either be increased or that there be an additional exemption included in order to address requirements for peer review when required. These new timelines will certainly require significant changes to internal staff processes in order to accommodate the regulations. And that's uh, a large amount of staff time between heritage planning staff, planning staff, our legislative coordinators, and legal staff. Another one of the new regulations is a 120-day 120 day timeline to pass a heritage designation bylaw following um, the conclusion of a 30-day objection period that has not received uh, an appeal. And so uh, staff normally try to pass designation bylaws as soon as we can anyways. Um, so that, that's not necessarily a problem, but we do appreciate that the province has provided another similar list of exemptions, um, especially through mutual agreement in case uh, special circumstances do uh, arise. As well, we would also note that implementing the regulations may require some staff time to accomplish. There's a new requirement, or sorry, a new uh, introduction of a 60-day timeline to deem a com an application complete. Um, this is actually brand new to the Ontario Heritage Act. It's something that's very common in planning applications where uh, an application is received and the municipality has a certain amount of time to review the submitted materials and make a determination of if they have all of the material required to make their decision. And so this is new, but it's certainly not unwelcome, as it does provide both clarity to property owners and to the town about when heritage permit applications can be considered complete. Um, they also provide a list of submission requirements that are set out in the regulations that are fairly similar to the materials that the town already requires when we consider uh, heritage permit applications. But um, we do note that a report should be brought forward to council to confirm Oakville's list of required submissions and adopted by municipal bylaw because this is now required by the new regulation. Um, we've also noted that the requirements for the complete application are only applied to part four. Those are individually protected properties and do not apply to properties designated under part five, uh, which are those that are part of heritage conservation districts. And so we would recommend to the province that the requirements for complete application also be applied to heritage district properties. There are now also new notice requirements for demolitions. And the requirement to issue notice for the demolition of any heritage attribute of a property was a concern that we noted in the Bill 108 report that council considered last year. The province has now clarified that um, a demolition may not require a repealing bylaw, which is very helpful. And instead, they've provided a process for us to consider uh, the necessary steps after the demolition of a heritage attribute or more uh, has been approved. Um, you can either amend the designation bylaw if you think that's necessary, or you can move to repeal it. Or if you feel that the bylaw doesn't need to be repealed or amended, the only notice requirement then is to the Ontario Heritage Trust, who already receive notice of all heritage permit alterations anyways. Uh, we'd note that the wording of one of the regulations is slightly confusing and uh, ask for uh, clarification on behalf of the province. Uh, what they state is after the demolition or removal of a building, structure, or heritage attribute on the property is complete, the Council of the Municipality shall, in consultation with the Municipal Heritage Committee, um, make, one of the final, make one of the following determinations. And what our, our issue is with this is um, the removal of any building, even if one isn't considered a heritage attribute, such as a modern garden shed on a property within a, a heritage conservation district, still requires uh, council approval, or if it can go through council's approved delegation process, or if it requires notice of demolish, uh, demolition. 
The regulations have also provided new requirements for uh, the submission of L, uh, LPAT materials, as well as a housekeeping amendment. Um, in regards to the LPAT requirements, the biggest, one of the biggest changes to the Ontario Heritage Act from Bill 108 was the removal of the Conservation Review Board, the CRB, um, and the submission of all objections and appeals to the LPAT instead. That hasn't changed. Um, all this, uh, all the province is doing in this regulation is simply setting out the list of materials that are required for the LPAT in order to review uh, hearing materials. And so the regulation hasn't changed our concerns at all. Um, it's simply a, a procedural element that will take additional staff time uh, behind the scenes. But the housekeeping amendment, um, oh, sorry, the housekeeping regulation, uh, which talks about um, the ability to amend a heritage designation bylaw is actually improved through the regulations that do make it much clearer um, than the old process as well. And finally, the regulation includes provisions for transitions. Um, right now, the uh, proposed uh, proclamation date for the regulation and all of the changes to the Ontario Heritage Act is January 1st, 2021. Uh, we note that this is uh, a very heavy uh, increased demand on staff time and resources in order to prepare ourselves for all of the changes that will be required by that deadline. Um, and specifically, as we haven't also seen the Ontario Heritage Co Toolkit yet, which is supposed to be our user's manual, we would recommend that the proclamation deadline be pushed to at least July of 2021 to allow municipalities more time to prepare, especially in consideration of the stresses of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has um, created a number of uh, interesting obstacles and stresses for municipality and, and staff resources. And so um, the news isn't all bad. Uh, we certainly support many of these proposed regulation changes. Um, even though some of the concerns that we identified in the Bill 108 report last year uh, remain in place. Uh, many of the town's existing processes will need to be adjusted to conform to these regulation changes, and we reiterate our proposal to provide more time to give municipal municipalities uh, t uh, time to prepare and accommodate these new regulations. Um, we'd also note that staff resources need to be evaluated in light of the current volume of heritage alteration applications um, to ensure that heritage reports and notices are occur occurring within the specific timelines so that we don't miss um, our designations and uh, unfortunately I, uh, the potential with the Heritage Act is if you miss a deadline, something could be demolished. Uh, the province has stated that they don't know what the cost and burden is going to be on municipalities as a result of implementing these regulations. We're suggesting that they would be significant given our stress situation already. Um, we're already in the process of undertaking a new large project to review uh, the properties that we have listed on the Oakville Heritage Register under Section 27 of the Heritage Act uh, by requesting additional staff, and I believe this will be considered by the Budget Committee ultimately. Um, but this project could assist in alleviating some of the challenges for staff where heritage properties are involved, um, and they may be able to, to help us with that. In closing, although some of the proposed regulatory changes are certainly helpful and positive, we do remain concerned that the province's stated objective to increase housing supply should not come at the expense of the town of Oakville's irreplaceable cultural heritage resources as the purpose of the Ontario Heritage Act is to protect and to conserve heritage properties, not to build more homes. And so the staff recommendation um, has pulled all of the recommendations that I've just uh, described in my uh, presentation to you here. It's pulled them forward uh, so that they're listed specifically within the recommendation itself. Uh, including pushing the proclamation deadline, changes to uh, the wording to match the provincial policy statement, uh, changes to the definition of adaptive reuse, uh, to increase the 90-day timeline for a notice of intention to designate uh, in light of uh, the potential need for a peer review, that the requirements for complete application also be applied to properties designated under Part 
uh, 5 of the Heritage Act and to provide us clarification um, about uh, the regulation uh, that states the demolition or removal of a building, structure, or heritage attribute um, uh, to determine if non-heritage attribute buildings are uh, excluded from this requirement. And then we would like the town clerk to forward a link to this report to a number of our different um, uh, associations, in, including um, our MPPs, Halton Region, our neighboring municipalities, uh, Conservation Halton, Credit Valley Conservation, Grand River Conservation Authority, and AMO for information purposes. Uh, I'd also like to note that in addition to Council's resolution tonight, members of the public can also provide their comments to Bill of 108's proposed regula regulation changes on the Environmental Registry of Ontario's website. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, let's see if you uh, actually left any, anything uncovered enough to generate a question. Council, uh, uh, Councillor Giddings may have a question. Uh, I don't have a question, Mr. Mayor. If none of my council colleagues do, I'd be happy to move it and thank staff for their effort on this. They had a pretty short lead time to turn it around. And uh, Councillor Duddock and I were certainly impressed with the other members of the advisory committee when this came to committee. And it was the desire of the committee to send this to other municipalities across Ontario through AMO. Uh, because our community is well known for our desire to preserve and protect heritage and we wanted to assist other communities that may not have those staff resources. Thank you very much, Councillor. Any other Councillor with a question or comment? Let me ask if there's any objection to the motion then. Madam Clerk, there is no objection and the motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Shepard. Thank you, Council. Uh, Council. Our next item is the Economic Recovery Initiatives Report from Economic Development and Strategic Initiatives. We have a presentation from Dorothy St. George, who is our Director of Economic Development and Strategic Initiatives. She approaches the podium now to collect the Zoom. <laughs> you have the floor or the Zoom, whichever you like. Thank you, Mayor Burton, and good evening, uh, members of Council. This is actually a timely report given the Provincial Review of COVID cases and some of the restrictions that are being imposed in geographic regions on indoor dining. The report before you tonight is about economic recovery initiatives. And you will recall at the start of COVID, Mayor Burton formed an economic task force to support the local business community. The product of the task force, or one of the products, was a commercial recovery initiative, which was approved by Council in May of this year. One of the components of the commercial recovery initiative is the Welcome Back Oakville marketing campaign, and its focus was on, on encouraging residents to support local businesses safely. It featured local businesses and needed to show that businesses were focused on providing safe spaces for customers and employees. Another component of the Commercial Recovery Initiative is the Digital Main Street program. Many of, many of you are aware of this. It began as a program um, as part of the mitigation effort with the Lakeshore Road Reconstruction Project. It was a perfect program to help continue to help con to continue helping businesses when COVID set in. And this year we received an additional $50,000 in funding that has enabled us to hire a third digital Main Street squad member. So we will have uh, one member in each of our BIAs helping our Main Street businesses. We have through this program assisted over 200 businesses through one-on-one -on -one consultations and webinars since launching the program in mid-2019. Our patio program was a successful component of the Commercial Recovery Initiative. Over 90 patio permits were issued under the program in 2020, and this is a large increase from previous years. On Friday last week, we issued guidelines to extend this patio program and to extend permits into the winter until December 31st, 2020. 
and under the Commercial Recovery Initiative staff were given authority to do that. We undertook a survey of existing patio permit holders and they indicated a desire to keep the patios open. Uh, this is to help them through the COVID pandemic. Our consultation with BIAs also indicated a strong desire to keep this program going through the winter. Issues you might think would come up in a cold winter environment, snow clearing, um, snow loads and wind loads on, and wind uh, capacity for tents. A lot of issues that we've worked through with our building, our fire department, um, zoning and uh, engineering departments, figure out solutions so we can keep this program going. So the recommendation before you tonight is to extend the commercial recovery initiative until the end of next year. Now the patio program is a part of it. So the re commercial recovery initiative, if you think of it as more of an umbrella program, it also applied to outdoor patios and displays. Um, it provided the use of town lands for various initiatives, um, provided for expedited approvals of permits. It also included marketing campaigns and so forth. So our recommendation is to approve this program for next year. It will help businesses plan for next year's patio season. And at the end of December this year, once we've had a chance to ascertain the feasibility of really having patios throughout a winter cold month season, we can determine whether or not patio season for 2021 will start in January next year, so it continues right through the winter, or whether or not we should push it out to start in the regular seasons, a regular patio season starting in spring. So the recommendation here is to extend the initiative into 2021 and provide staff the authority to figure out what's the best period for patio season next year. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Director. Uh, the first question, the honor of the first question goes to Councillor Chisholm. Thank you, Worship. Um, the extension of the, uh, the patios, I think, is a great idea, but the concern is um, insurance. How are we going to handle the insurance issue with continuing on through the winter and possibly longer in 2021? Well, the insurance is provided through the patio permits that we have, and it's usually associated with insurance that restaurants uh, have for their main business, whether it's inside or out. I guess the, the, uh, the delve a little deeper on that because there are tents um, and gas heaters, uh, the risk potential uh, would probably increase. So I'm just wondering how that's being handled, that being handled through an insurance or, uh, work or the fire department, how are we coordinating that? Through you, Mayor Burton, we've um, established some very um, detailed guidelines and fire department will be undertaking inspections for all the patios who will, that will be constructing or erecting tents on their sites, uh, as well as um, having a review of any heating units that are utilized. So the guidelines that you'll see in the appendix to this report are quite detailed and we've actually um, clarified them even further with regard to the tent structures. So uh, in conjunction in our discussion with um, building and the fire department, we found um, tents of a certain size will require certain uh, work to be undertaken. So if they are more than three meters away from a building and under 30 meter, square meters in size, then they need a fire inspection if they're gonna use any heating. If they are between 30 square meters and 60 square meters, then they also require a review from the fire department to um, ascertain the ability to withstand wind and, and snow capacity. If it's beyond 60 square meters and, th and three meters away from a building, then a building permit is required. So that is a more extensive review that's undertaken. So we, we've looked at the various yeah, uh, scenarios. Yeah, sorry, I, I understand that, but well, the, the, let's go to the legal liability. If there is uh, an accident or a fire, are we, is the town held liable for this or is it the, the owner of the restaurant? 
Uh, through you, Mayor Burton, I think in, in any kind of um, potential accident, um, uh, an injured party may attempt to, to action a claim against anyone. So if it's town lands, they may um, not only um, start an action against the restaurant, but against the town. And the town maintains insurance on its lands um, and would be covered under that scenario. Thank you. All right, is there a motion or, or perhaps a question? Let's, uh, I belatedly see hands. We have uh, Councillor Longo, Councillor O'Meara, and then Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Dorothy, just a quick question, uh, and I'm glad you addressed the question about the heaters. Um, so that, I mean, the report was pretty clear about that, the guidelines that had to be followed and, and the fire department being involved, which is great. Have we ever thought of, uh, you know, looking at something from an economic development perspective, similar to what they do with, and I, I know this is kind of out there because it's COVID, it's happening, but to actually talk to, to places like Quebec City that have done a kind of an outdoor festival that could be, there's some kind of a market that's outdoor, but that would be something that people could bring, show what they have, have people come by socially distance, all that kind of stuff, but do something that kind of leverages winter in a different way um, that can help with businesses. Uh, anyway, it's kind of out there, but just a question, if you've thought of something like that, and, you know, the carnival that, that goes on in Quebec City or Nordic Climates to do something that would help, you know, spark some interest in having people come downtown or the, BIA, the various BIAs. And maybe that's already happening, but I, I've never seen anything kind of to the extent of what was done in Quebec City and growing up in Quebec going to places like that. Um, and I recognize COVID's there, so the whole concept of, of social distancing, but is there something to consider that we do to, to help our businesses in winter outdoors and kind of bring people together? Uh, through you, Mayor Burton, uh, you, you raise a good point um, in that this is a COVID situation. Uh, so we want to encourage people to come out and support local businesses while at the same time you don't want to have an event that brings a, a crowd of people to any particular location. Um, however, uh, we have been meeting with the um, Community Services Department to talk about how we can um, bring forward a winter strategy, winter plan, to encourage people to undertake activities throughout the town. So that's ju we're just in those discussions right now. Um, we'll be coordinating that with the various BIAs uh, with the um, intent to provide activities, much like um, um, you would find in, in Quebec City, um, to bring people out, get them active, but not in a situation through COVID that would draw a big crowd. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, next. It's you, Sean, yeah. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, thank you for that, Dorothy. Um, do, are we tracking how many businesses have closed since COVID? Do we know that information now? Uh, through Mayor Burton, no, I don't have that information at this time, but we will be um, uh, having further discussions with the BIAs. Um, it's a difficult thing to do um, or, or to get that information at any point in time um, and to get an accurate information. Halton Region did undertake an, a business impact study. You'll see some of the numbers in the report. I think it was 74% indicated that they had negative um, or had um, had a negative impact from uh, from COVID, um, but we don't have at this point in time number of closures. Uh, we we're we're reading every day almost um, old iconic restaurants closing or shuttering their doors. So I think it would be very important for us to do the legwork to find out um, you know what the real impacts of this and. Uh, my second question is, um, how, often, how often is the task force meeting um, now, and what else are they working on besides patio uh, initiatives? Uh, through you, Mayor Burton, um, what we've done is transition the task force right now. We, so it's really meetings that are being held regularly um, with the Chamber of Commerce, the BIAs, and Economic Development. Um, so. Um, there's work on the patios. There's um, a review, review being undertaken of 
uh, a new marketing campaign to encourage people to be coming out safely. And there is that discussion I mentioned previously about um, alignment with a winter strategy. So uh, what can we do th through the BIAs and economic development um, to bring people out? Sorry, can you just, what, what did you mean by you've, transi you've transitioned the task force? I don't understand what that means. So, um, so with the, the task force had Mayor Burton um, and his staff attending meetings on a regular basis. We now, uh, now that we've implemented the commercial recovery initiative, it's, we've moved into, into a, what we're calling a resiliency uh, group, which is primarily the same composition for implementing the initiatives that were identified through the task force. And it's just a staff, okay. it's the staff level. Okay, so we're still meeting with the BIAs and the chamber and all those partners as well and working together on that? Absolutely. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor. I think that brings us to you, Councillor Hazlitt Thiel. Thank you, Mayor Burton. Um, my question is a little bit different. Um, first, I want to start by saying I think it, it, the the level of teamwork between the chamber, um, Invest Oakville Economic Development has been um, very high through COVID, and, and my hats off to you because uh, there's a lot of different subsidies and grants and all of that. And I know that you've been trying to keep the web page as up to date as possible, so businesses uh, between the chamber and, and the Oakville page can know what's out there. But knowing that there's provincial and federal subsidies. Can you answer the question for the public about what else could we do in terms of this ongoing question we get about tax breaks um, for businesses and small business? Um, because I don't know that everybody understands what a municipality can do versus the overall uh, um, uh, efforts of the province and um, the federal government. Could, could you just speak to that for the public? Uh, through you, Mayor Burton. So we are unable to provide tax breaks to businesses uh, just as we are unable to provide a financial incentive to attract a business to come to Oakville and that would be considered bonusing under the Municipal Act. So what I would suggest is that businesses do take advantage of the numerous programs that are available at the provincial and federal level as well as our local level. Uh, I indicated that we had helped about 200 businesses through our digital Main Street program. That's one-on-one -on -one business assistance to help people transition to an online environment and to help them well into the future beyond COVID. And so 200 businesses, that's a, that's a big help, but that's free assistance for any of our Main Street businesses. And I would recommend that the businesses try and take advantage of these programs uh, and, and subsidies that are available at all levels of government. In, in addition to that, Councillor, um, apparently it's been, I, I covered this in my nightly <coughs> newsletter recently, uh, the province and the feds have introduced a new uh, grant program for businesses that allows them to be uh, compensated not only for property taxes, but also for hydro and for other expenses. So. Uh, uh, we've, uh, I, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I fielded this question a lot from local businesses. I think the word is getting out, and uh, I, I hope that, uh, that with this, uh, it will spread further. Do you have another question? So I do. Um, there was a time when we had um, a vacant uh, rebate bylaw, and I'm not by any stretch at this point suggesting that it should be reinstated. Um, but the context of that allowed um, some compensation to a landlord whose building was remaining empty. And of course, we don't want to incentivize or reward someone for an empty building. But in terms of the legalities around being able to frame that bylaw versus what we could do now, is the economic or the commercial recovery initiative looking into just getting out of the box and saying, what else could we do um, legally that would help landlords step up to the challenge of finding alternatives um, for some of these vacancies that are, are popping up 
um, with more regularity than, than any of us would like. Uh, through you, Mayor Burton, um, I think we, uh, we do explore different ways to help businesses. Um, the, the vacant properties uh, are, are difficult at this time during COVID. Um, it's, a, it's a supply and demand. The, 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 you know, we have the supply with these, some of the vacant properties as in many, many municipalities. But during this kind of an economic situation and a pandemic, there is not the interest in, in renting new facilities. Uh, we're seeing it not only in our retail, but in, uh, in our office development as well. Um, we've spoken with some of the uh, larger uh, property owners and the message is we've got to wait it out. And with our beautification that's been done in downtown Oakville, We've created an environment that's going to be one of the most attractive places. And as we come out of COVID, it's where businesses are going to want to land. So, you know, the work that's being done both on um, the beautification, uh, it's becoming a beautiful spot for businesses to land. We will certainly be doing marketing, um, as will the BIAs, to try and attract the businesses um, when that demand is there. Okay, thank you. I hope that helped the public as well as, as because as you know, the BIA and uh, has been working hard on uh, uh, alternatives as well. But I just wanted the public to hear some of your thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lischina, were you next? Yes, I was. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy, uh, with respect to the businesses that aren't members of the chamber or are not located within the three BIAs of the town, so for instance, up here in North Oakville, are you getting any um, more reach out from them at all or, or more um, participation of those types of businesses that were not part of the BIAs or the Chamber with the town? Are they engaging with the town more? Uh, through you, Mayor Burton, we hear primarily on the retail side from the BIAs and their memberships. Um, but the patio program was quite successful in bringing in patios throughout the town. Um, we've engaged with um, um, places like Oakville Place, so outside the, the BIA, but um, certainly one of the larger retail establishments in the town. Uh, we respond to inquiries that come in, but we also do uh, make a lot of effort to push out the information about the programs that are available um, through social media, through our Invest Oakville newsletters, um, and other means, just just engagement with, with businesses to tell them, um, provide the information that they might need to know. Councillor Robertson. Dorothy, thanks for your report. I just, um, I said the vast, vast majority of residents have loved the patios. I hear such good things about Bronte, about people wanting to go, coming to sit on them. I, we've also had some feedback and concerns about the road closure at Marine. If we decide to extend something like this, will we be garnering resident input somehow in terms of extension of, of something like that? Uh, through you, Mayor Burton. The, um, the patio permit that was provided this year um, on Marine Drive in Bronte was done as, as, a, as a pilot, as a way to help businesses uh, expand their outdoor seating. Um, we would solicit input um, uh, from the area as to uh, whether or not they'd want to see it again next year. So um, we're trying different ways to utilize some of the town properties uh, to help the businesses and yes, to answer your question specifically, we would look for input on whether or not to continue, say, the closure of a road. Okay, thank you. And so does that mean that Marine will not stay open for the duration of the winter then? Uh, if it meets all the other requirements of patios? Uh, that's correct. That patio will be coming down shortly. Thank you. Is that more for is that more for snow clearance? That's correct. Or yeah, I, okay, and, great. Thank you. Yes. Already, um, I, Councillor Hazlitt, deal. Is that a motion? Yes, I'd be pleased to move it, Your Honor. 
Thank you very much. Um, Council, is there any objection to the motion? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. The motion carries. Thank you, everybody. I'd, I'd ask your attention now to the advisory committee minutes of the Heritage Oakville Advisory Committee for the meeting October 13th. We need to receive those. Councillor Duddock moves receipt. Council, is there any objection to receipt? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. That motion carries. Um, would one of you give us a motion to rise and report to Council? Councillor Sandju, thank you for that. Any objection to rising and report? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. That carries. I rise and report the Committee of the Whole has met and has made recommendations on consent item one, public hearing items two and three, discussion items four, five, and six, and advisory committee minutes item seven, as noted by the clerk. We need a mover and seconder to adopt the report. Councillor Chisholm and Councillor Elgar, thank you. Any objection to the report? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. The report is adopted. Is there any new business of a emergency, congratulatory, or condolence nature? I would, I would like to beg your permission to go first and uh, wish Councillor Knoll a very happy birthday and many, many happy returns. There you go. We all applauded you, Councillor. Don't get used to it. Thanks. I appreciate the uh, best wishes on my 29th birthday. <laughs> very good. Councillor Sanju, you had something? You beat me to the punch, Mayor Burton. Oh, well, thank you for letting me. I, I wanted to, uh, I, I did want to do that. All right, uh, in the absence of anything else, a mover and seconder for consideration and reading of the bylaws. Councillor Lischina, Councillor Longo, congratulations on winning that foot race. Any objection to the bylaws? Madam Clerk, there's no objection. The bylaws are considered and read and passed and that is one entire bylaw, the bylaw to confirm the proceedings of this meeting. Council, that completes the work that we had to do together. Uh, we did it before we hit the witching hour. Congratulations. Thank you very much for your time and attention and your contributions. It is terrific working with you, and we are adjourned. Good night. Yeah. Yeah.